Alright, and a Conavod video. Uh, so, um, I, you know, conceptually there's stuff to work with here, so I'll work with it. So he ended the video by saying something, you know, if, if you want happiness, blah, 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 you know, eat some candy. Um, and then uh, something about, you know, you want uh, something, uh, truth or something, then stare into the face of reality as if, you know, this is this that what he's saying is something to do with reality, and that's sort of the argument is the the truth is on trial here or something. You know, that's what's being tried is what um, what are reasonable descriptions of uh, our reality. Um, so I, I've never quite been able to get what he's talking about his tiger that he rides and the you know this. Uh, coming out of the cave thing, I, you know, I can come up with other metaphors for it, um, like you take a caveman, you know, from 5,000 years ago or something, or no, well, obviously more than that, <laughs> 50,000, and you, you know, he's one minute sitting there doing his rock against rock kind of tool thing or whatever, and the next minute he's here in modern reality, right, 52nd Street or something. And um, it's just not going to be comprehensible. It's, you know, it's going to seem all like some other world, some other reality. That it's not any kind of evolution of his reality or any kind of even connected to it. It's going to be completely alien. Like, completely in that almost water and air are suspect. Um, it's just not going to make any sense. Light coming out of things where the sun isn't, all kinds of weird things like that. It's just not going to be comprehensible. And the reason why it's comprehensible to us is because we're fed it a little piece at a time through our maturation. So it's the consumption isn't all at once. You can't force feed somebody um, everything at once and maybe he's talking about something like that and then I would argue well why would you try to eat the meal that way why, why would you try to let's say you're going to eat an elephant and you're going to take an ear to eat the elephant you know you can't eat it one day um, can't be done all right so that was just a way of me trying to understand what he is saying about some sort of future shock <laughs> and I, I'm still going to argue that it's just a shock it's just a the problem isn't the truth the problem is that it's being forced in you too fast it's like me going to Japan and expect I'm going to speak Japanese now I can't speak Japanese now can't do it in one day so it's all going to be difficult until I acquire some uh, ability to comprehend and understand until I'm matured into the environment. Alright, All right, so I'll, I'll go back to the beginning where I started with my notes. Um, because it's sort of, these are important things just to acknowledge. So he sort of acknowledged, I've sort of acknowledged, that our different perception of time and physics um, means that we really are growing two different trees of perception. And they could possibly be close enough to each other that the branches can, in some constructive way, interweave, but it could be that they're too far apart to ever uh, have the same birds in them <laughs> or, you know, have anything meaningful to do with each other in terms of what reality they can exist in or communicate, um, entangle with their roots or something, however you want to describe being more productive or being capable of interacting. And um, I think I can defend a linear perception of time, that it is progressive that it's marked by even what you might even call keyframes in a video. You know, it has markers that are 
key points, key bits of knowledge acquired, key key dates in history, you could almost say. Um, maybe not the ones in recorded history. Maybe the key dates really were some other little event that took place that was much more important. Um, but just this idea that there were moments where um, new opportunities arose because of a victory or a defeat and the causes for those victories and defeats and they completely change destiny. Um, you know, I sort of argue that little key moments are like um, maybe when George Bush was standing there with the bullhorn on top of the dead 9-11 victims. But at that moment, he could have made us, um, um, he could have given us integrity and said, we're not going to react because of a few lunatics. Because a few people don't respect anything. They don't respect a fair fight or decency or they have no character because they're low ball. You know, we're not going to play that game. Uh, we're not going to blame all of Islam because there's some people who want to create war. And that's exactly what they intend to do. And that was known by the government. That was known that that was Osama bin Laden's objective was to cause a war and to walk right into it. You know, so I'm just saying history could have been very different if that speech was different. And I would argue. I mean, I know that's, I'm, I'm adding a, a politically, um, you know, um, <laughs> what's the word? I um, can't even think of the simplest words. I mean, this ugh, getting old really just sucks. Um, uh, not ch it's uh, challenging, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, controversial, con <laughs> controversial. Um, so yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to distract the conversation with politics. But I'm just saying that. Okay, so there's all these moments, and I'd say these moments are real. They happen in the past, and they change the future. The future doesn't change the past. The past changes the future. The things can be understood as different things. And it doesn't really matter to me, as I stated before, I don't care about worrying about when they happen. Just the idea that we kind of know that there's rules about which ones do what. And, and again, the fundamental rule is past events change future events. And so um, that's one of the rules. And it doesn't, like I said, I don't really care if you say the future happened first, uh, as long as you understand that the future is dependent on the past. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, and, and then I, I would argue that the other part of that progressiveness is, you know, the whole word progressive, you know, that it is linear, and that the process is a polishing, a, a perfecting, you know, that I could say that you could even just use some simple example like, you know, the Model A, the Model B, the Model C, the Model D, the, you know, all the way up to the Model T, right? <laughs> you know, um, that through the process, you start off with something that's pretty crappy um, and it's perfected. And you could argue that so much of some of our obvious technology has been perfected. And you could argue that some even some social mechanisms are on the way to perfection in the sense that they get better, they get improved. So you could argue that some, you know, we have these different health distribution mechanisms in the world and you can see which ones cost how much money and, you know, how um, able to um, satisfy people's immediate, immediate desires are they are and all of these things. You can see the trade-offs being made. But the idea is is to create a certain kind of efficiency, you know, is to to create a system that can provide the best technology at uh, you know reasonable pricing and that kind of thing and so it's getting it's getting worked on and I would argue that because things you know in their in their creation there's this period where it's spit and sputter you know it doesn't just come off the assembly line perfect um, you know, Anna Conovod's kind of claiming because our civilization is still in the spit and sputter stage that there's no escaping it, that it's always never fixed, it's never made better, it's never fully improved. And 
Clearly, we have all kinds of growing pains because of the acquisition of technology. So you could argue that, in a way, people were better off in the past. I, I mean, I've made this argument that in this silly, crude way, we are so much more, um, we're in such a worse living condition in the sense that if you add up the amount of time the average human spends in a disabled, sick, or dying condition, it's a huge amount of more time. So even though people were catastrophically ill in the past, you know, they had the plague and cholera, all kinds of infectious diseases, um, you know, you know, all the, the fevers, you know, the many of them, um, really tough, really nasty, the flu, uh, it killed them quickly. Um, so yeah, they didn't spend nearly as many days of their lives as a percentage of their life. They spent a higher percentage of their life in good health than in poor health, because they also died younger. Um, and one, I think, could argue that you know, by that standard, they had a much, uh, they thrived, okay, to a much higher standard than we thrive because of that poor percentage of um, time spent debilitated, uh, damaged, in pain, um, uncomfortable, unhealthy. So that's a sputter. Because you're saying, wow. The future is supposed to be better than the past. <laughs> it's not supposed to be... Things shouldn't be getting worse like that. And you can do this with the number of people starving in the world. You can do this with people in poverty. You know, you could say, you know, we're worse off than they, we were when there was indentured servitude and slavery. Because so many people are enslaved to low wages. So there's lots of standards you could use to say, gee, this model of civilization sucks. And so, but I'm just saying it's the wrong conclusion. I'm saying it's not, a, it's not fair for you to have this expectation that it was all going to happen easily. And one of the reasons it doesn't happen, the reason why there is so much spitting and sputtering, is exactly what you're causing. Because people keep scapegoating. They keep, they keep not fixing it. They keep doing this futile escapism crap or something else instead of showing up for the war and fighting the fight and getting it done in my opinion um, that's one of the problems that's why it doesn't get engineered and fixed is because no one wants to do the work of engineering and fixing it um, they don't want to compromise um, what comfort they have um, to get it right um, but I'm going to argue that it's there to be perfected. It's there to be polished. And um, I'm certainly arguing against all the people who don't feel like polishing. Because, yeah, it's worth it. Um, all right. So he views the timeline as unidirectional and unprogressive. That's how I stated it, undirectional. Um, <clears throat> And I, I quite obviously, I'm arguing that no, this is a, this is something that it just isn't going to happen. You have to build it, and you have to work on engineering it. And we kind of know what we're after, in the sense that there's this way of, you know, kind of, you kind of know what being productive is. You know what being a contributor is. You know what, you know what it looks like when somebody's making more food than they're eating. Okay, when you know what it looks like when somebody's giving more than, you know, they're cleaning messes rather than making messes. Um, and it's just identifying these things in the system and figuring out where you gotta, you gotta tweak it. You know, the engine's just not good enough. It's wasting fuel. It's dripping gasoline. It's getting too much oil in the cylinders. It's too dirty. It's too this. It's too that. And all of this just needs to be better engineered. It needs to be better engineered by people who have seen the world and people who, <laughs> you know, people who do have something called intelligence. Those are the people that need 
to be applying that to fixing it, not to making excuses to say, fuck it, uh, I'm going home. I'm going into my own uh, matrix. Anyway, um, so again, I, I'm, I, you know, he keeps emphasizing these points, and I'm just saying I don't think you're ever going to convince me that the past doesn't exist and the future doesn't exist and that events don't happen in this linear manner <laughs> and that uh, what I just described as the reality. I'm, I'm pretty damn confident that that's what this is. This is something that's building and um, it's a crude system but there's every... it's like the pyramids. You know, they when you think about people having so little knowledge of the world, but they built them, they did it, they figured out a way. Now, sure, it wasn't the most efficient way by today's standards, but they did it, and um, they worked it out. And I'm saying this is a game that can be worked out. It needs to be worked out. Whether we like it or not, a kind of pyramid has to be built. We have to, if not doing it will guarantee sloppy and it's like you know so so this working on this social infrastructure thing these this these this cultural memes thing there can't be anything more important because um it's going to mean the difference between you know increasing or dis decreasing that quality of existence quotient all right um so he says we're not a god, and <laughs> yeah, that's you know we're people, we're just men, and we can't know, and we can't, and you know again that's a, I I think of that as just an excuse. Um, he does a lot of these references from the Bible, or I mean from religion anyway, and these um, mythologies, and I could argue that the Bible has a lot of that in there that knowledge is God that God is the Word, and that the Word was like the Ten Commandments or like the Golden Rule, um, and that this is hard wisdom. That this, is a, this isn't meaningless wisdom, that this is really good wisdom, this is knowledge, this is the key to the game. And I think that's part of what Jesus was sort of arguing, is that the, you, you want to stop a revenge war? Well, stop making revenge. You worry about what you're doing, and if you if you stop being a spring, there's no energy. There's no. It can't keep happening. So yeah, you'll you'll end up taking a bullet a few times, but overall, there'll be less war, a lot less. So it's a plan, and it's not an unreasonable plan. Yeah, it requires a short-term um, compromise. A I'll get hurt in the short term, but you'll win in the long term. Um, kind of like the not negotiating with terrorists kind of idea. You know, it's just very hard to live up to because it's immediate. Something's right there at stake, um, and it's hard to sacrifice the value you see right in front of you for some promise of saved value in the future. But the truth is, it's, it's good wisdom. And we should really try to make that wisdom uh, embraceable, um, a, a, a real principle, something we cherish, uh, not because it's easy, but because it's hard, you know, a candyism or something. <laughs> you know, uh, you want to do it because it's the right thing to do. All right, so then he was getting onto the argument of, you know, the, it's always an interesting one. You know, is there any such thing as an unselfish act? And I've sort of argued that action's the tricky part. So I could argue that there's plenty of unselfish thoughts. So you can have unselfish thoughts. You can understand something unselfishly. I can understand 2 plus 2 is 4. I, I have no self-interest in the answer. It just is the answer. I don't... I can even be bigoted against 4 and say I really don't like 4. I'd rather the answer be 3 or 5. I like odd numbers more than even numbers. 
But I know it's four, so I'm unselfishly saying two plus two is four. Now I can logically do the same thing with notions of reality. And I could ask, I could argue that I've many times in videos said I'm an asshole. I mean, I'm, I am. I'm a selfish cunt. And uh, I don't like that. Now, what? there's nothing selfish in me degrading myself, right? I mean, there's no real self-interest that could be found in me. Ooh. I mean, I'd rather be able to just say, no, I'm, I'm really perfect and great. And I've never failed and I never make a mistake. <laughs> you know, I'd like to be able to say that, but I know that's not true. I'd like to say that I've, I've performed exemplary, you know, just totally, um, always right on pace, and that I've never uh, compromised a true value for my own convenience or something. Of course I have. Of course I have. Uh, so I'm just saying that I could say that that's an unselfish thought, and I can say that me saying it is an unselfish action because you can't really make anything out of it. You can't make any profit out of it. Personal interest is kind of lost there. And, um, you know, unless you're going to argue for a false humility or something, but I think, you know, I think, uh, I think most people would understand that would be the last thing you would argue about me. <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't really matter if you get my, if, if you concede that there are, um, thoughts, even when you, um, <clears throat> like I say, you see your own self and you see yourself do something kind of bigoted, you know, in an attitude or something, and bigoted not in some, like, I always kind of try to make distinctions between um, people's behavior and their class or their race, and, peop and, and understanding the difference between culture or um, personal character and uh, race or something like that because yeah it's just totally unfair to blame <laughs> you know the the bad habits even if the majority of a race have those habits even if it's perfectly even if you're perfectly capable of profiling the fuck out of them it's still just cheap and it's not good logic to assume so that assumption is stupid um, that it has something to do with race and it doesn't have something to do with culture and something to do with um, where people are maturated and in which circumstance they're living in. And so you can see that in yourself, and that's, uh, I would argue, these are unselfish perceptions. So then I could, okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to fight it to death. But what, what, I, what I am saying, though, is once you understand something, you have a principle or an idea, when you make it into action, you're usually going to have to have a self-interest in the sense you have respect for the principle. You've become devoted. You might even love the principle. Like, I might love the golden rule. I might love the idea of it. And um, so it is personal now. Um, but that, that, that emotional expression is perfectly consistent because I don't have any uh, logical objection to that admiration. It's kind of deserved by logic. So it's not um, a prejudice and it's certainly not a self-interested um, perception. So I can believe in things that aren't in my own interest. Um, I, could, I could believe I'm I'm not as an individual over my lifetime. I haven't quite, <laughs> I haven't been productive enough in, in some kind of practical ways, economically, to, um, to have my existence justified. Um, and that if I would vote for a law that said, you know, yeah, if you, if you, can't, if you can't play the game to a certain efficiency, you, know, you sort of have an obligation to get the fuck out. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. But I'd give people a, a graceful exit. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't oblige the unproductive to be tortured. And if they really just couldn't deal with the idea of gracefully exiting, I'd give them a right to plead, to defend their existence, and to say, I, you know, I really just, I'm not comfortable with dying. <laughs> you know, 
or defend themselves against the accusation that they aren't productive enough. Um, but I'm just saying I have no self-interest in diminishing, um, you know, the value of my own existence or degrading it, its meaning. Yeah. Um, so anyway, all right, so I, but I could bring up, and I have in the past, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, banning dog fighting, uh, banning sadistic animal cruelty for fun, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, child labor, um, dangerous labor, slavery. Um, so all these things, I think, can be argued that the people who, who did the work weren't doing something selfish. Um, I, certainly there are charities now that exist where it does seem like it's just a social club and they all want to feel good about themselves and wear ribbons and say, I'm fighting for, you know, and they're all kind of proud of themselves. But I'm just saying because it's like some vegans even, you know, because some vegans do that, are you going to say all vegans do that? That's just an expression of a bigotry. I think you can understand that there are people who are quite sincere in the sense that, uh, you know, they're compromising their own comfort, their own desires, um, because they know it's the right thing to do. And I know you don't like that. You don't like the concept of guilt, but that's what it is. It's a rational perception that's inconsistent with their personal interests, and it's kind of unselfish in the sense that the principal wins and the selfish interest loses. So I think it does qualify as a altruistic, <laughs> unselfish act. But anyway, I, I, I'll concede that most actions are tainted by most people because most people are pretty selfish. So you have to kind of give them a personal interest in doing the right thing. <laughs> they need to get a badge. They need to get a, they need to, uh, an upgrade in their status if they do the right thing. It's, it's not easy for people to do the right thing unless it profits them in some way. They, they need um, reward and punishment consistent with doing that. But that's sort of the catch too, right? Because I could argue that the rewards sometimes are very small for the amount of the good done for doing it. So the little, the fact that you have to give them a little candy um, of ego um, rubbing um, is a minor price to pay for the good of their sacrifice. Yeah, that might be a good thing to say. So that kind of altruism in the sense that, okay, it's selfish. There's a self-interest, but the self-interest is so much smaller than the contribution to the cause. And I think that's what has created these refinements in our civilization that are clearly refinements. They're clearly advancements in a positive direction that has nothing to do with self-interest, especially the ones that don't involve human interest. Okay, um, so then you get into this staring reality in the face again. I just put question marks. What the hell does that mean? Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I'm sorry. Staring reality in the face seems to me to be staring the the fact of our um, the fact that we haven't done. We've left so much on the table that there's. Everything is so underdone. Everything is so spit and sputter. Um, and there's just so much waste produced by the, the lack of will to do the perfecting. Um, okay. So, uh, which way to go? I can go this way or I can go that way with the notes. I think I'll go that way. Um, so I, I guess I'm kind of arguing that this is a, a trial um, and that you can always put things on, you know, what's being tried. Um, you know, this argument about what the truth is and it's it's still going to be based on, you know, the, the evidence. So, so, I mean, you can't just, ha you can't just pretend that, um, well, I'm not saying you're pretending, um, that all conclusions are outside of the realm of having a quality 
you know, that's based on the quality of the evidence. And I think you're evading a lot of that with these blanket statements as if there's no evidence of anything or there's no proof or you can't prove. And I guess I would argue that I think you can logically prove. I mean, the kind of proof you want is kind of like when somebody says, I have to prove I feel or something. What do you, what do you want me to do? I, mean, I can't do that. I can't give you a material presentation of the proof. I can only give you the logical evidence for its existence. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so then it was this filter argument that, um, and and he, you know, I I would argue our brain. I can't remember what kind of filter he was calling it, but my argument is that our brain is kind of a bullshit filter. I mean, it's a good filter. And then the, the irony of his argument is he's arguing how he's anti-herd. And I'm making exactly the opposite pointed argument at him. He's, a, he's Borg all the way down. Borg, 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 Borg. He's the herd. I mean, he's the one saying the narrative makes sense. That there's some reason to create new victims. There's, new, there's reason to do this. The Borg says so. The Borg wants it. Um, and uh, you know he's, or, or, or else he's magically contriving some bizarre notion that the idea of reproducing was something he originally came up with, and that he had a, he did it for some original reason besides vanity um, or convenience makes the wife happy. Um, and I would argue I don't think he did it for either. I don't think he did it for any other reason than those crude reasons. Some crude uh, force inside of him that made this an agreeable idea and it had nothing to do with anything anti-Borg or anti-Herd and had everything to do with something very Herd and very Borg um, and uh, you know it's just that he thinks he's Jedi so apparently he thinks his kid's going to be more awake more Buddha because he'll be able to indoctrinate him and somehow he's not going to fall into the ignorant trap the person who is living the unlived life of someone who doesn't even know they're suffering as he described them um, and if they don't know they're suffering why should I care that they're suffering again you have to care because the only way they can become unignorant is for them to be corrected by somebody who <laughs> is unignorant <laughs> so the unignorant have to correct the ignorant that's the way it has to work um, I mean, that's even in Buddhism, you know, the, the wise Buddha, you know, instructs the, you know, the, whatever you call them, the molestables, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the students. Um, all right. Um, all right. So I did the learn in pieces thing, which I think was a good argument. Um, and and that are, you you can't um, you can't do this maturity thing in a sloppy or or half-ass way, and we've done that in our cultures, unfortunately. So there's a lot of pieces missing from people's connection to the real game they're involved in. So they lack an overview and they lack a big perspective because we're not maturing them into their life on the chessboard. And they really just don't have any knowledge of it. They just know the squares in front of them and that I'm supposed to take ground and I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do that. And they really do lack much, they don't have much perspective. And that's, um, again, spit and sputter. That's a flaw in our culture that it can't do any of this important. Um, See, because it all gets into this battle with the religious folk, right? Um, I mean, if you do any philosophical preaching in grammar schools, then they'll claim a right to bring God into the schools and to do their philosophy. And, uh, and clearly, lots of, um, there's lots of advocates for, for perspectives that are silly. You know, I, I wouldn't want Pyrrho's philosophy taught in schools this unrealistic idealism um, 
but it's sort of a big huge part of maturity that's left out of the game um, because students aren't challenged um, you know to defend what happens in the world it's like in, in in school I learned history I mean I learned that there were Jews and I learned there was Germans and that they were killing and there were brutalities and there were wars but you never really got to the question you know you never got to any debate about who was really right and who was wrong and why everybody had to react the way they reacted and causality was sort of left ambiguous because we can't get into the politics of causality and this is a huge um, vacancy in education and that's why that's why there is all this diversity that's why you think you're anti-Borg and I'm looking at you and seeing Borg anyway and you likewise are looking at me as you know fascist uh, uh, Pol Potian or something um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, because we're <laughs> there's no there's huge spit and sputter on foundational facts, and everybody's allowed to just make up a fairy tale and live by it. And especially now, I mean, people are actually living the WWF kind of narrative. You know, they're they're actually grown people who are almost living in that world, like <laughs> you know. Like this is relevant and meaningful. Spooky. Um, all right, so this is not about popular opinion. This is about uh, a rational trial of evidence. So that's my argument. I'm not arguing in defense of popular opinion. So I'm certainly not saying that um, you should comply to popular culture. I mean, obviously, I'm not complying. So that's part of what's kind of interesting about this conversation. We're both on fringe branches, you know, and um, of the tree of human perception. And But yeah, it's there, there's very little common branching to our branches. So you almost have to go all the way through the common man to get to the other side where you're at um, and so I would be I'd be agreeable that there's nothing much in the popular culture to have much confidence or um, to feel very inspired by um, but again I as I have argued in videos that's sort of our failure right uh, I mean what ignorance there is in the world exists because somehow the unignorant um, who are supposed to be smarter um, can't make a decent argument in defense of what they're saying and uh, should be we should be able to I should be able to say something like this is a trial of evidence and we have an obligation to obey certain rules of evidence and I know that sounds not possible to you that there could be these rules of logic and that it could be um, that this is the only real way to get to a better designed car. But you can't get to it if you don't have these rules about what efficiency is and what productivity is and what we're really after here, which is some rational balance between, you know, addiction and consumption and, you know, desire personal and social interest gameplay there's more than one piece on the board there's just no way of denying it you can't you can't if you're going to deny that truth that the universe isn't your piece that as a factual nasty truth the board you're playing on is crowded it's not your trampoline it's not a personal event. It's an event that happens in a collection of events. And the impact potential is undeniable. Your movement moves the ground thereon. You just can't 
So that's another one of these key things, like the progression of time. If you can't accept that reality, or you won't accept it, wow. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, we got, we just have no way of having a rational conversation because that's the truth to me that creates every bit of limitation. Like I said, I'd say go ahead. You want to go into the some rabbit hole somewhere, and you want to squint your eyes and make the world all funky, go ahead. But you can't do it when you're on this this crowded table you can't do it in this china shop and that's what we're in whether you like it or not you're in a china shop and you just can't do this i'm going to pretend i'm blind thing no 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 you can't do that it's wrong it's impractical it's doomed to fail you're doomed <laughs> you know, to break more China than you make. Um, but whatever. Um, all right, ignorance can't be uh, unintelligent. Ignorance can't be made unignorant. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I'm sorry, yeah, this is just the terminology used in the video, so I'm just playing with it. Um, so the ignorant can't be made unignorant without correcting. That's the determinism. And so that's where the obligation comes from. It, it, the, the, the correction ain't going to happen until somebody corrects. So the people capable of correcting have to try to correct. That logic is, in my opinion, just unassailable. It won't happen if we don't make it happen. The butterfly has to flap its wings to get off the ground. I mean, these are just fundamental rules of the game. Um, sorry, and then he used the word like, they have deliberately. And, yeah, I'm personally a little pissed off, and I often use concepts like that. Like, yeah, they're deliberately stupid, and they're deliberately escaping, and they're ex deliberately playing a game. But obviously they're not doing it deliberately in any kind of, you know, uh, they're not being an asshole, really, on purpose. Um, but it sort of feels that way. It sure has the appearance of it. But you kind of know that, no, it's... Somehow the world has matured them poorly. Just, just poorly. Um, so the last critique I would have for you is that um, you know, you've used the word scapegoat, and I think that's what you're guilty of scapegoating and um, you know there's a huge difference between being skeptical you know people people make these silly arguments you know simple arguments like uh, well it's great to have an open mind but you don't want it so open your brain falls out you know and this idea of skepticism is reasonable you know let's let's be skeptical of popular opinion let's be skeptical of the, what appears to be the easily grab solution by the selfish cunts. I mean, that's the irony, kind of what you're saying. You're non-herd, yet I would, uh, I would argue that you're ahead of the herd because the herd loves the selfish. The herd loves this me-first shit. And that's why we live in shit. It's because of exactly that reason, uh, this justification for, um, you know, because uh, truly unselfish is a little hard to define, that somehow selfish is okay. I mean, fuck. It doesn't work that way. You don't make something okay because something else is precious. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you don't make, you don't make shitting in the living room okay um, because diamonds are rare. Uh, you know, it just, it just, two activities have almost, almost nothing to do with each other. You're not liberated to be an asshole because it's hard uh, to be... Um, whatever the exact opposite of that is, the perfect opposite. Because you can't find the perfect perfect opposite of an asshole, it doesn't mean you're allowed to be an asshole, or you're free to be, or that's the only choice. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, my sort of the, the other analogy I would use for it is this idea of the, the simple, easy answers, the, you know, what we're supposed to do is try the facts, let the facts define the truth and you know instead people are applying all kinds of convenient skepticism 
convenient blinders, convenient, I'm going to ignore those truths or those facts, and they just do this truther crap. Give me a simple enemy, give me a simple diagram, and hopefully it involves me eating cake and pudding. So, you know, instead of going to World War II and defeating Adolf Hitler, <laughs> you know, they want the answer that says, no, you sit on the couch and eat pudding and ice cream. And that's just, um, yeah, garbage. <laughs> that's just being an asshole if you think life works that way. It's, it's not going to work that way. It's not going. It's not going to function. It's not going to be perfected. It's just going to be a shitty piece of crap of a car. And if the human race wants to be something, it's going to have to do a lot better than this. The humans are going to have to be trying a little harder and quit playing all these games where they make up their own realities and all this kind of bullshit. And that's what I'm trying to do here, you know, is I'm trying to force those arguments and um, get to them, specifically these premises that people are using to create all this fake skepticism and all this excuse for believing preposterous nonsense, like 9-11 was an inside job and we never land on the moon and everybody's crooked and power corrupts absolutely and blah blah cliche after cliche after cliche of just crap just bigoted bullshit scapegoat 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 because they don't want to do the work they don't want to invest in fixing it so they just want to declare it permanently broken because that's convenient especially especially if they started bouncing first on the, on the trampoline and all the other pieces are disrupted and falling over and falling off and it's not them. They've got the middle ground, they've got the high ground. So all of this crap comes from people sitting in a place where they're less vulnerable and it's just so easy when your own ass isn't in the fire. Um, you know, to talk shit about what it is to be burned alive. <sighs> so anyway, I'll just say again, I, I think you are Borg. <laughs> and, and again, most importantly, the only, the only reason why I even care that you're Borg, like I said, I, I care that there's dead wood, you know, that we got, it's like this is a lifeboat and we got we got people on the lifeboat who are actually dead. You know, like, <laughs> fuck, why are the dead people on the lifeboat? So that would be bad. But it's not like you're a dead person. You're one of the people drilling holes in the damn boat. You know, let's make more of a mess. More people. More people in the ocean. You know, you're, it's like you're, you're making more sea monkeys that are going to grow into people, and then we have to put them in the boat. You know. So, I mean, it, it's bad enough the dead people in the lifeboat, the ones that will make no contribution or just a pain in the ass, just taking up space. Um, but it's really bad when you got, you know, terrorists <laughs> you know, on the boat. That's kind of how I view what you're arguing. This, I don't know, I'm not a god. I don't know what I'm doing. I have limited knowledge. Yeah, I'm going to make some more people doesn't sound consistent. That sounds like something a god does. Creating life, that's kind of what gods do. Not humble people. Not people afraid of the dangerousness of the whole game. They're not the ones aggressively doing that. So there's a certain contradiction in your knowing your limitations when you don't think your limitations include creating living things. <laughs> you know, that somehow that's not outside the scope of your qualifications. I think it is. I think you'd know it if you thought about it. You'd say, yeah, well, just because nature gave me a penis doesn't mean I know how to use it. I think you'd know that's how it works. And uh, it's kind of just bullshit to say, because I have seed, I'm going to plant it. Um, that's just bullshit. So anyway, I think that's enough said. So, interesting, blah, blah. I don't know whether we're getting anywhere. 
<laughs> but we never have gotten anywhere, so not getting anywhere in this circular fashion may or may not be of any value. And like I said, we're both doing the same. I mean, you're arguing. I'm just saying you're throwing it out there. This is what I am. This is who I am. Well, I'm doing the same thing. This is who I am. This is what I, I can't see what you're talking about as a reality. Your, your description is just... Uh, I, 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 I have tried. I am squinting hard. And I just can't make the colors you're seeing. Um, I can't make reality go away. I can't make the simple vision of me being one of seven billion human beings and being one of trillions or whatever it is of other mammals <sighs> breathing in and breathing out and having desires and doing all of this crap I can't I can't undo that as a rational perception of what's happening right now on planet earth that's what's happening and it, it happened in the past in a different way than it's happening now the continents were in different positions different animals were eating each other all kinds of different ship dinosaurs were walking the earth it was a different place in the past and now it's a different place in the present and it'll be a different place in the future. And I'm just saying we're, we're the participant. We're where the fulcrum is. And um, what has been filtered out of the past is going to decide what the future looks like. We either did a good job or a bad job of mixing the past. And I don't mean we as individuals. I almost mean we as the collective of the universe universing the universe is going to fail or succeed it's not going to be us and I'm just saying um, it happens through us though and we can see the failure I'm just saying intellectually you can see it this trial should be the evidence is almost it's so conclusive the evidence is right there how can how can you keep how can, how can you keep denying the evidence that all that is required is for us to look at it and say, that's bullshit, that's bullshit, that's bullshit. The only thing that really matters is this equation between desire and gratification and that you have to get that without causing suffering. So you have this negative thing, the suffering. You have this desire thing, which is interesting. And you have this consumption thing you have to do it through. And you have to do this consumption thing without making this suffering wave. And if you can't come up with a way, good way of doing that, you can't do it. You can't play the game because it doesn't add up to sensible. It just adds up to expensive. Waste. So if we want the universe to stop being a wasteful slut, we have to recognize it's a wasteful slut. You know, we have to recognize it for what it is. We have to say, yes, I see that it's wasting. And we must stop it wasting. Something like that. Well, the fact is we must do it because there's no one else. Superman ain't going to do it. God isn't going to do it. If it's going to happen, it's because we're going to put on our little soldier suits and we're going to go do it. That's the only way it can happen. It can't happen any other way. We have to do it. <sighs> okay.